You turn with me to 2 Corinthians 8. Father, thank you for the gift of your word. To hear your voice, the voice of our shepherd. Give us ears to hear. Give us hearts to respond with obedience, with trust, with love. To follow. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life. And I shall never perish. Father, help us to have ears, give us ears to hear what you would like to say to us today, and may it change our lives for your glory. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. 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 It's a gift to give. And Paul is writing to encourage generosity, to encourage fellowship in the grace, the gift of service to the saints. He is eager for Corinthian participation in the collection that he is administering. But he insists that the handling of resources be done with integrity. And that's what our passage, uh, what I want to focus on in our passage this morning. 2 Corinthians 8 verse Uh, Starting in verse 16, but thanks be to God who put it into the heart of Titus, the same earnest care I have for you. For he not only accepted our appeal, but being himself very earnest, he is going to you of his own accord. With him we are sending the brother who is famous among all the churches for his preaching of the gospel. And not only that, but he has been appointed by the churches to travel with us as we carry out this act of grace that is being ministered by us for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our goodwill. We take this course so that no one should blame us about this generous gift that is being administered by us. For we aim at what is honorable, not only in the Lord's sight, but also in the sight of man. And with them we are sending our brother, whom we have often tested and found earnest in many matters, but who is now more earnest than ever because of his great confidence in you. As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker for your benefit. As for our brothers, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. So give proof before the churches of your love and of our boasting about you to these men. In these verses, as we've seen, Paul is highlighting his purpose in this collection. It is for the glory of the Lord himself. And to show our eagerness, our willingness. Paul wants the Lord Jesus Christ to get glory through this act of grace and fellowship from the Gentile churches toward their Jewish brothers and sisters. Paul mentions in verses 19 and 20 that he and his co-workers are serving, they are ministering or they are administering this grace. Verse 20, this generous gift. Literally, this fatness, this abundance. Paul has said in verse 14, the abundance of the Corinthians should supply the need of the Jerusalem saints. The Corinthians had been eager. They had promised participation in this collection. Paul expected them to give out of their abundance. And he anticipated that this grace would be fat, a plump gift out of their overflow as God has blessed them. Now, a gift like that necessitated care. Today, we can transfer money electronically. We can just, there you go, you transfer that money, safe, relatively, uh, 
If we're traveling, we could get a traveler's check. We could carry a check that's relatively a safe form, uh, less easily stolen. Uh, but in the ancient world, that, that was not an option. Travel with a large sum of money was extremely dangerous. In Jesus' story in Luke 10 about the Good Samaritan, he says a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. It was dangerous to travel in the ancient world. It was especially dangerous to travel if you were carrying valuable things, goods, money. Paul in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 26 lists danger from robbers second in his list of dangers that he faced in his journeyings, in his travels. Now a group journeying together would offer much more protection from thieves than a person traveling alone. So there's a very simple practical reason why Paul is sending a group. And planning a group journey. Paul, in this passage, begins to list some of the travel companions that will accompany the o and oversee this gift. Now, back in 1 Corinthians 16, when he gave instructions on the collection there, he said, When I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. So at that point, Paul is saying, I don't know if I'm going or not, but uh, whoever you recommend will carry your gift and ensure that it gets to the right hands in the right way. If, if it's helpful, I'll go with, I'm willing. At this point, now as he's writing 2 Corinthians, he's going, there's uh, Asians going, there's uh, Galatian people from Galatia going, there's people from Macedonia going, uh, there will probably also, he's hoping, be Corinthians, people from Achaia and Greece going. This is going to be a group. Now, one of the accusations that Paul defends himself against uh, earlier in the letter in chapter 3 is not having a letter of recommendation. He didn't come with a letter. He says, you're our letter of recommendation, written on our hearts. Here, he's including in this letter, 2 Corinthians, his commendation, his recommendation, the credentials of Titus and the other brothers who are accompanying him. He's giving the Corinthians, you're worried about letters of recommendation? Here you go. This is, this is that. He thanks God that God put the same earnest care that Paul has for the Corinthian church into the heart of Titus. Titus had been invited by the apostle to return, just came from Corinth. He says, go back to Corinth, bring to completion the collection that was started. And Titus himself was eager to go. He had a heart for it. Verse 18, with him we are sending the brother who is famous among all the churches for his preaching of the gospel. And not only that, but he has been appointed by the churches to travel with us as we carry out this act of grace that is being ministered by us for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our goodwill. Now, with Titus, Paul is sending an unnamed brother, but a brother who was well known among the churches. Literally, uh, translated, it says, the brother of whom the praise in the gospel through all the churches. Different translations render this, whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches, who is praised by all the churches for his service to the gospel, or his work in spreading the gospel, uh, whose fame in the things of the gospel has spread throughout all the churches. Uh, as these translations show, there's some ambiguity in Paul's language. Uh, the brother of whom the praise in the gospel through all the churches. Does this mean that this brother was praised for preaching the gospel? Or was he praised for supporting and encouraging the advance of the gospel? You see, gospel ministry includes evangelism. But it's bigger than evangelism. 
sharing the good news of Jesus Christ crucified with lost people. It's, it is that, but it's bigger than that. See, the good news of Jesus Christ crucified for sinners, raised from the dead to new life, it affects all of life. Gospel ministry, serving others in and with the gospel, includes evangelizing the lost, sharing the message to those who don't yet know him, as well as discipling and teaching and exhorting and encouraging in the gospel. This today is gospel ministry. Here, among the saints, we are gospel, we're ministering the gospel to one another. Now, not all of us have been gifted as evangelists. But as Paul tells Timothy, we as followers of Jesus ought to be doing the work of an evangelist, whether we have that specific gifting or not, in whatever opportunities God opens up to us. And we all ought to aspire to be those who are always diligently engaged in gospel ministry. In whatever ways we have individually been gifted. Whether that's encouragement, exhortation, teaching, serving, giving, loving. What a commendation whose praise in the gospel is throughout all the churches. May that be true of us. And not only that, but he has been appointed by the churches to travel with us as we carry out this grace that is being ministered by us for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our goodwill. Now this brother had been appointed by the churches to accompany this grace that was for the glory of the Lord himself. Notice who the churches appoint to accompany a financial gift. It doesn't say he was a shrewd and successful businessman. It doesn't say that he was well-educated, good with numbers. It doesn't say that he was big or strong or good-looking or popular. The church has appointed someone who understood grace. Someone who knew that he was a sinner. Someone who had been forgiven by God's sheer unmerited grace displayed in Jesus on the cross. A man whose only hope was in the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ crucified and risen. A man who had been transformed by the gospel. And who knew that the only hope for the world was the good news of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in our Lord Jesus Christ alone. This is who the church selected to help to oversee a financial gift whose praise in the gospel is throughout all the churches. Notice all the churches. It says that twice in this passage. The churches appointed him, plural. Jesus, in Matthew, said, I will build my church, singular. <laughs> and yet here we have the churches. And in the New Testament, we have letters addressed to the church in Corinth, the churches of Galatia, the church of the Thessalonians. And here we are the church in Ephraim, Utah. There is the church, the body of Christ, the Catholic church in the, universe, in the original sense of the word Catholic, universal, the broad, inclusive church that includes every Jesus follower over all the globe and throughout history. And then there is a church, in a particular geographic area, a local church. Believers who meet together regularly for teaching, mm -hmm. fellowship, worship, prayer. Okay. Who baptize believers into that larger body of Christ. Who remember Jesus together by breaking bread. Here Paul's focus is on the many churches. Local 
groups of believers who meet together in a geographical area. This brother has a good reputation in gospel service throughout all the churches. And we don't know who this guy was. There's lots of speculation. Make up some commentaries, thumb through. There is all kinds, there's pages of speculation of who do we think this guy was. Uh, we could speculate Apollos. He was well known in Corinth. He was, it says in Acts, eloquent, competent in the scriptures, spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus. Could be Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Co-laborer with Paul through the first half of the book of Acts. Uh, Luke, the physician, who also accompanied Paul on much of his gospel ministry. Possibly, uh, likely I might say, it was one of those named in Acts 21 as those who were sent by the churches to accompany Paul in bringing this gift to Jerusalem. Uh, named there are Trophimus or Tychicus from Asia, Timothy and Ga Gaius from Galatia, uh, probably not in that list, Sopater or Aristarchus or Secundus. They were all from Macedonia, and Paul says in chapter 9, the Macedonians aren't coming yet, they're coming with me. And that's why I want you to be ready. So it's probably not one of those three, could have been some of the others. Or it may be someone who's not named anywhere in the biblical record, whose praise in the gospel is throughout all the churches. And with them, we have Titus, we have the brother whose praise in the gospel is throughout all the churches. With them, we are sending our brother whom we have often tested and found earnest in many matters, but who is now more earnest than ever because of his great confidence in you. Titus, the brother whose praises in the gospel throughout the, all the churches, they would be accompanied now by a third brother, one who at many times and in many ways has been tested, proved. Being earnest, he was now much more earnest in his confidence for the Corinthian church. Paul commends him for his earnestness, for his eagerness, his diligence. And he says, he's not new. He's been tested many times, many ways. Likely this was a co-worker of Paul's who had traveled with him, who had been in different scenarios, different circumstances with Paul. His character has been proven over time and in different circumstances. His eager diligence had been demonstrated more than once. There is simply no substitute for proven character, tested over time in diverse circumstances. This is the kind of person that we take and say, this is a person that can be trusted with this kind of a service to the saints. And he had a gospel confidence in the Corinthians. He says, he's... he's confident in you. Now Paul had expressed his own confidence in the Corinthians. In chapter 1 verse 15, chapter 2 verse 3 with a different word in 7 16. Uh, in chapter 3 verse 4, his confidence is through Christ toward God. Paul and this brother are confident in the Corinthians not because the Corinthians have proved themselves worthy of that confidence. But because they observe the grace of God at work in the church in Corinth. And they're confident in God's transforming power through the gospel. See, the Corinthians have proved themselves unreliable, fickle. But both Paul and this brother see something bigger at work. As we read in Philippians 1, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will himself bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. This is gospel confidence. And this brother's gospel confidence made him more eager than ever to serve in this way, to watch God work 
in the lives of a messed up, broken community of believers. Paul explains in verses 20 and 21 his reason for sending multiple people. We already discussed a practical reason of safety. Here he says it, probably his primary reason. We take this course so that no one should blame us about this generous gift being administered by us. For we aim at what is honorable, not only in the Lord's sight, but also in the sight of man. Paul's character has already been under attack in this church. As he said back in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, with me it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. He says, what people think of me is really small. It's what God thinks that is big, that is significant. It is a very small thing to be judged by people. And he says, even my own conscience, although I ought to listen to it, is not my final judge. It is the Lord who judges me. Paul lived his life before God. He lived in the presence of God. He was daily, moment by moment, aware of God's presence in his life. God was aware of every act, every motive of his heart. And above all, Paul considered God's opinion more significant than anyone else's. He says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 9, So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. <laughs> in a very real sense, Paul played to an audience of one. It didn't matter what people thought so long as he pleased the Lord. But, in another sense, he was eager to be understood. He said back in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 2, By the open statement of truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 11, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. What we are is known to God. And I hope it is known also to your conscience. See, God knows my heart. This is what really matters, but I hope it is known also to your consciences. Paul here is applying wisdom from Proverbs 3, verse 4. We take this course so that no one should blame us about this generous gift that is being administered by us. For we aim at what is honorable, not only in the Lord's sight, but also in the sight of man. Paul is aware of the danger of accusations when it comes to handling money. He does what he does so that he cannot be blamed of impropriety. He doesn't entrust this to just one person. Regardless of how great their integrity, he makes sure there are multiple people involved so that there is accountability, so there is protection. Now when it comes to the offering here at this church, we have only trusted people handling the money. And even though we trust them, even though their integrity is great, for their own protection, we have more than one person involved in handling the money. There's accountability. What you give, you give to God. And the money, that's God's money. We seek to handle it in a way that is above reproach and transparent. We keep track of what comes in and where it goes. And we communicate that to you. If anyone has questions about the finances of this church, that's no secret. You can ask. We aim at what is honorable, not only in the Lord's sight, but also in the sight of men. Few things can discredit a ministry quicker than mishandling of money. 
Peter gives us this advice in 1 Peter chapter 2. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. It says in verse 15, For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. You see, integrity matters. And public integrity matters. It matters not so much because we care what people think of us, but because we care about the glory of God. And when we act dishonorably, it dishonors Christ, whom we represent. Paul, uh, Peter tells us that our honorable conduct ultimately glorifies God puts to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Paul seeks not only in the collection of itself, but in the way the collection is handled, he seeks the glory of the Lord himself. As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker for your benefit. And as for our brothers, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. <clears throat> Titus is my partner. He's the one I have fellowship with, communion with. And he is a co-laborer to you for your benefit. As for the brothers, the brother whose praise is in the gospel, the tested and earnest brother, they are apostles of the churches, sent out on mission by the churches. And he says, the glory of Christ. This is an amazing statement. The glory of Christ. Paul seeks above all to glorify the Lord himself in everything. The church is the glory of Christ. Now in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, he wants us to see the light of the glory. The light of the gospel, the good news of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. God opens our blind eyes to give us the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Chapter 3, beholding the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Chapter 4, verse 7, we have this treasure in jars of clay. The churches, the glory of Christ. See, we look at a church, a local church, and we see flaws and faults, and frustrations. We're disillusioned, we're disappointed. Well, these are supposed to be the people of God, and they're not perfect. But God looks on the churches and their ministers as reflections of his own glory. God's glory in earthen vessels, broken, fragile, flawed, clay pots. God's aim is to show his glory. Show that the power belongs to God and not to us. And God's aim is to sanctify His church, Ephesians 5, so that He might present the church to Himself in splendor, glory, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. This is the will of God for you, your sanctification. We are to reflect the glory of God in everything we do. Integrity matters. Father, help us to be men and women of integrity, 
of character, proven <laughs> character. Lord, help our hearts to, above all else, seek to please you, because ultimately your opinion of us is all that matters. Help us, enable us, free us, liberate us to play to an audience of one. And to recognize and enjoy your pleasure as you look at us, expressions of the glory of Christ, containing, transforming power in flawed, fragile earthen vessels. And Lord, help us to recognize our responsibility as those who image forth your glory to the rest of your creation. Lord, we want to accurately represent you. You are a God of holiness, a God of integrity, a God of faithfulness and justice and truth. <coughs> so, enable us by the transforming power of your Spirit in us to be men and women of integrity, of character, proven character. Lord, may our earnestness, our desires, our passions match that our aim is above all else for your glory. That we are passionate about seeing your glory at work in the churches. That we have gospel confidence, not in flawed humans, but in the transforming power of the gospel to make all things new. Make us new, we pray, for your glory. In Jesus' name.